Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to give you an introduction to instructional design. My name is Lindsay O'Neill. I am a teacher and trainer in instructional design and e-learning. I am fascinated by how people learn and I love teaching other people how to do instructional design and how to teach more effectively online. So here's what we'll cover today. We'll talk about what makes instructional design instructional design, and that includes instructional design models slash systems. We'll talk about how people learn, including what I call the big three learning theories, and we'll cover memory, motivation, and feedback. Of course, this is a relatively short video and there are entire degree programs in instructional design. So we can only touch on these things today, but if you like this presentation, I have tons more content on my YouTube and I'm adding things all the time. So be sure to like and subscribe so you can get into that. All right, so let's dive in. Let's define instructional design. One of the funniest things about this field is first off that no one really seems to know about it, but then once they learn about it, they say, oh, it's really interesting. But if you tell someone that you're an instructional designer, they go, oh, like, like wallpaper and paint and furniture. They think interior designer. And I'm like, no, <laughs> not quite. That's a different kind of design. Uh, instructional design is all about creating effective learning experiences. I keep my language really broad when I talk about learning experiences because a learning experience can be anything. It could be a video, it could be a presentation, it could be a worksheet, it could be in a classroom, it could be independent. It can be anywhere, any place, basically doing anything. So instructional design is all about just figuring out how to be systematic in structuring and developing any sort of content and experience to facilitate learning. Again, kind of loosey goosey language here because I'm trying to be really inclusive of all the different possibilities out there for learning. Now, one of the funny things about instructional design is that sometimes your mind feels like this. There's so much you have to know to be effective in doing instructional design and creating really engaging learning experiences. There's a lot of things to consider. It can be difficult to get started, but the more you do it, the more sense it makes. Now, here's some of the things that you should know as an instructional designer. Of course, number one, you should know the science of learning, how people learn, how the brain works, how people engage with content and media, how things actually get into long-term learning. You should know a little bit of um, educational technology. We'll talk about two major systems, also known as models, in this video today. So you should know how to be really systematic and planning out. Usability is really important. You often see this word and concept associated with web design. Any online experience should be very usable. Graphic design is important. You don't have to be a graphic designer, but a basic knowledge of visual design is really important. It helps to know a tiny bit of coding, tiny bit of coding. At least if you got the logic down, you're good to go. Accessibility is really important, making sure that everyone can access your learning experience and copyright, I would say, is important as well. Now, this is this is a lot of stuff to know. Don't feel like you need to learn all of this right off the bat, of course, but the more you do this, the more you learn, the more you pick up over time. And of course, in the field, what you need to know really depends on where you end up working. There's so many job titles in instructional design that you may never have heard of. Of course, we have instructional designers. Instructional designers are hired by the, by the bucket load every day. You might hear learning and development specialist, learning experience designer, user experience designer. Again, you kind of see that overlap with usability there. You might focus on curriculum. You might focus just on designing e-learning. Maybe you're just going to develop e-learning. Ooh, strategist, that's a good one. So some of these, these job titles also are trying to be more inclusive of all the possibilities as well. So you see things like strategist, um, learning architect, learning engineer. Again, kind of getting loosey-goosey with that language, but it's interesting to see 
how people are trying to reach for all the possibilities by coming up with these job titles. And of course, there's the, the humble trainer at the bottom there. It's a really varied field, lots of specialties, and I like to say that no matter what facet of instructional design interests you the most, there is a niche specialty out there for you. There's a niche job out there for you. So that's kind of the quick overview of instructional design, what it is, what kinds of job titles you could expect. Let's dive in to the core of instructional design, which is instructional design systems. So again, as a reminder, instructional design is all about the systematic structuring and development of content and experiences to facilitate learning. When I talk about being systematic, this is basically standing in contrast to kind of the, the old school way of teaching where someone stands in front of a room and they just, they just talk at you. They have a lot of deep knowledge about something. They just get up there, they talk for an hour. You're in the audience, you're leaning back, bringing it in, just absorbing it. And hopefully some sort of learning happens there. In contrast, instructional design is not just about kind of talking and seeing what happens. It's about being really systematic and bringing in everything we know about science and how people interact with content to really create effective, effective learning experiences. So new instructional designers are commonly introduced to Addy, and I like to add in Sam as well. These are two models. I use models and, inter and systems pretty interchangeably. These are two models and kind of very interesting contrasting ways to approach instructional design. So the idea is that when you're systematic about designing a learning experience, you would engage a model or a system like Addy or Sam to kind of help you work through the process to make sure you are being really systematic in planning out a learning experience. So on the left, we have Addy. It stands for Analyze, Design, Develop, implement, evaluate. It's just an abbreviation. And you start seeing kind of how this is systematic, right? You need to analyze your learners, uh, design kind of an idea what the content would be, start building it out, implement it, maybe put it onto the learning management system, wherever you're going to make that happen and kind of evaluate the experience after the fact. So that's Addy, old school, gets the job done. Not as tidy as it as it looks when you actually use are using it in real life, but it's a really good way to start thinking systematically. Now, in contrast, we have SAM. This is a newer model, very new school. Uh, stands for a successive approximation model, and it's only well, I guess it's four steps: analyze, develop, design, repeat. The idea with SAM is that you are thinking more of prototyping rather than trying to be super systematic and like really front loading, front loading the design work, then just building it out and like basically never going back. SAM is all about kind of repeating the process, building a, a quick and easy prototype, seeing if it works, tweaking it, trying again. So here's some illustrations of these uh, two models. So Addy, it's, it's kind of often described as being a waterfall. We kind of start at the top and one step flows into the next and then to the next. Again, this looks really tidy in real life. You realize like, oh, I'm missing part of the analysis. I have to go back. Or maybe you're building out the design, but you realize, oh, I missed something or this needs to be changed. And there's a little bit more back and forth than there would look like here. And one of the biggest challenges of this, this, model is that the idea is you need to get kind of everything right the first time because by the time you get down here there's so much work done that it's really hard to go back and change things but again this is a really good model if you're new to instructional design when you're trying to be systematic about building out a learning experience this is a great way to kind of set your mind and start working through the process again in contrast we have sam SAM is all about rapid prototyping. So you do a quick analysis, you do a quick design, you do a quick develop, and then you kind of rinse and repeat. So the idea is rather than potentially wasting a lot of time up front with Addy and realizing down the line that this maybe isn't going to work, you dive right into prototyping, try to build something, see if it works, Keep what you like throughout the, the rest. Maybe start fresh, start over, try something, try again. So you can see how these are very different models. I mean, both of them, you're going to put in more work maybe than you need to for a final product, but it kind of depends how your own mind works, which one of these models that you are really uh, drawn to. Sam, I would say, is a little bit less systematic, but as you're working through this prototyping process, you need to take 
good notes, figure out what works well, what needs to work better. This, this model is probably better for more advanced instructional designers when you've been around a while. So you have a good feel from the beginning and what's going to work and what's not going to work because otherwise you might end up wasting a lot of time here. So another view here, contrasting these two, Addy has a huge emphasis, analysis and design. It is time intensive. It is important to do it right the first time because it's kind of hard to go back and forth when you've put so much work in at the beginning. In contrast, Sam, you just dive in quickly, adjust as needed. It is about prototyping and there's lots of revising. So these are a, a really nice set of models to kind of start thinking about instructional design. If you're brand new, I really recommend kind of approaching this, the process with Addy first. Uh, maybe there's some easier, smaller situations where Sam's going to work well for you. But again, it also really depends on how your own mind works. I like to say that there's no perfect answer in any instructional design situation. There's so many ways to get things right. There's never just one way to get things right. So the more you do this, the more you practice, the more we're going to figure out that there's better ways and worse ways, but there's always lots of ways to get things done the way you want to get them done. All right. So let's go into a knowledge check. I got a bunch of little knowledge checks sprinkled out throughout this presentation for you. All right, so quick knowledge check. Which model puts more emphasis on pre-development work like analyzing and designing? Is it Addy or is it Sam? If you said Addy, you are correct. Addy is more systematic. It's known as a waterfall type of process. It really has a lot of emphasis on pre-development work like analysis and design. All right, if you just wanna dive in with the prototype, which model would you use? We said Sam, that is correct. It's more new school while Addy is more old school. And this is a model in which you just kind of dive in, start designing and see how it works out. So, I mean, you might be asking, how do you choose? I don't actually have any bullet points on this slide. It really does depend on how your own mind works. It depends on your personal context. If you're a solo instructional designer, maybe a more flexibility in choosing. If you're part of a team, you're probably going to be locked into how the team works. Maybe there's some organizational culture as well that influences how you approach your work. Again, the more time you put in as an instructional designer, the more things come easily and you get a sense of what's going to work and what's not going to work, what steps you need to put a lot of work into, what steps maybe you can put less work into, and you'll have an idea from the beginning of what pitfalls to kind of avoid or you'll have an idea of how to how to address these things more quickly as problems come up. So that's the systematic part of instructional design. Again, this is a relatively short video. I've got a lot to cover, but let's go ahead and dive into how people learn. So you've got the kind of models in place. Keep those in mind as we move through the rest of this presentation. All right. I love this book. If you're a new instructional designer, you've probably had this book recommended to you. If you haven't, I'm here to recommend this book to you. Julie Dirksen wrote a wonderful book. It's humorous. It has illustrations and it's a really nice primer for how people learn. One of the biggest things I want to cover right away is actually that learning styles are a myth. If you've heard, oh, I'm a, I'm a physical learner, I'm a kinesthetic learner, I learn best when I do things hand on, hands on, or I'm a visual learner, I learn best when I'm reading something. Listen, that's a myth. Human brains are all more alike than they are different. Learning preferences, however, of course, are real. If you prefer to read something rather than watch a video, that's a preference. It's not necessarily to say that you learn better one way or another, like biologically, that's just a way that you like to learn. So disabilities, of course, will also affect how people learn as well. So myths, uh, learning styles are a myth, but preferences matter. And of course, disabilities matter as well. And what's really important is that how you learn was really going to depend on what is being taught. Like if you watch someone doing math, you're learning how to do algebraic equations, for example, you can watch an instructor with a whiteboard for hours doing them in front of you. But until you actually put pen to paper and are practicing doing the math yourself, you're not going to get it. And without that active learning, you're never going to learn how to do algebra. It takes a lot of practice to do that kind of thing. Same with history. You will 
probably absorb a lot through a lecture, a lot through reading, but until you sit down, take some notes, process this, you're not going to learn just from one way or another or just by listening to podcasts. For long-term learning, you need to do something. So the only thing that holds true for all people is that there needs to be active learning. If a person is passive, they're not going to learn nearly as much as if they are active in the process. So learning styles are a myth. <laughs> Preferences are real, disabilities, of course, are going to affect the learning experience. And what's really key is that um, it needs to be really active. So that's actually my first bullet point here. So this is when learning happens. That's when the magic happens. Learning needs to be active. It needs to be engaged. Furthermore, feedback is critical to that process. If you are trying to figure out, again, the algebra example, and you're working on problems by yourself, if you don't have an answer key for those things and you're not sure if you got it correct or not, that's that's not an effective learning experience, right? So think back to school when maybe your instructor had you work on the, the even or the odd problems in the problem set in your textbook. And that's because there's an answer key in the back so that for your math practice as your homework, you can work through and see if you're getting the correct answer or not. That's feedback. Knowing if you got the answer correct or not is feedback. If you are just doing um, the math and you don't know the correct answer, you're not getting feedback. You're not going to know if you're learning correctly or not. And that's also where misunderstandings and um, problems can happen. You might be thinking you're learning, but you are not actually learning. All right, so that brings us to adults. Instructional design tends to be an adult-focused field. It does have roots in uh, the military and getting soldiers up to speed quickly so they could go and enter World War II. Um, I teach adults generally, so my, my teaching tends to focus on uh, adults as well. But it's interesting to c contrast adults and children, how one, le one learns better versus the other. Adults are really motivated by, you know, why does this matter to me? Adults tend to be self-directed. You know, they have less time. They have, um, you know, adult lives to live. They have families. They have jobs. They have things that are, are demand on their time. So adults are going to learn differently than children who tend to have, you know, all the time in the world. And they might be more... Um, motivated by external factors, whereas adults are like, give it to me, tell me why this matters, I'm going to decide if I'm motivated by this or not. And of course, motivation is really important. <laughs> you need to be paying attention and you need to be motivated to be able to learn. I'll talk more about that in the, the memory section in just a moment. But when we're thinking about how adults learn in particular, it really helps to think about learning theory. So this is a, a free book online. I've got a link uh, here in the presentation if you want to download this presentation. Um, it really helps to get familiar with learning theories to start thinking about how your particular audience learns. Learning theories are called theories, but they are research-backed and verified ways to start thinking about how people learn. There are explanations for how people learn from which you can draw strategies, tactics, techniques to build out really effective learning uh, experiences. Learning theories also provide the foundation for, you know, figuring this stuff out. So that brings me into what I call the big three learning theories. Again, when you're new to instructional design, generally you're introduced to these three learning theories and you see them over and over and over. Once you understand these three, there's like hundreds of other learning theories that kind of kind of branch off of these. Once you understand these main three, it's going to help you approach learning differently and more specifically for your target audience. So here's the big three. It's behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism. These are all very distinct and separate theories. Let's talk about what they each mean. Behaviorism. We always start with behaviorism. Behaviorism tends to be pretty well known by a general audience because you might think of Pavlov's dogs. The mind is a black box in this theory. We don't actually care what happens in the mind because only the input and output matter. The idea is with behaviorism, this is a very old theory by the way, that we can get the output that we desire just by figuring out the input, okay? So like, what you need to do is just figure out the right input and reinforce it to get the output that you, that you desire to stick and happen over time. So Pavlov's dogs, they figured out they ring a bell, um, 
they gave the dogs food, the dogs salivated. Eventually they took out the, the food part of that experiment and then when they ring the bell, the dogs are still salivating because they associated the sound of the bell with food. So very simplistic uh, explanation of how, you know, I have a simplistic view of how people learn. Obviously the mind is more than just a black box. What happens there is really important, but there are ways to use this theory that are very helpful. So if you think of behavior as something like building blocks of learning, sometimes there's things that are really boring to learn, but you need to know them in order to move on to more advanced concepts. So in behaviorism, maybe you can provide some external rewards to help someone learn these basic concepts like definitions or um, important dates in history or that kinds of thing so that when you get to more advanced concepts, you can use more higher level theories and strategies because they already have that foundation. So behaviorism can be a really useful theory to apply when you're trying to get some sort of foundation in place in a learning experience. All right, cognitivism. I like this one. The mind is like a computer in cognitivism. And again, it's an overly simplistic explanation of how the mind works. I'm glad this theory is looking at the mind. The mind is a little more complex than the computer, but it's a good way to start thinking about how people think. The idea is the mind is like a computer because new information is coded and structured to fit in with existing information, okay? And this theory, the, the learner needs to be active and engaged. In this theory, everything should be chunked and designed in a way to facilitate processing by the learner. That's really important. It needs to be designed in a way to facilitate processing by the learner. Your learner is each unique. They have a unique worldview. They have unique experiences. They bring an existing set of knowledge and skills and opinions uh, to any learning situation. So it's important that we structure whatever this learning is in a way that's going to make it easy, as easy as possible for them to process and incorporate what they already know. So this was what brings us to uh, learning objectives and backward design. Uh, learning objectives are behavioral statements where we kind of are structuring a learning experience from the ground up by saying, all right, at the end of this, you should be able to define this given topic. You should be able to explain this process. You should be able to analyze and see what's going on with this. So it's all about kind of breaking down a learning experience into smaller pieces and structuring it so that your learner is going to be able to work through the the process and get there with you and backward design is all about you know figuring out where you want the learner to be starting with that thought process and figuring out how to build a learning experience that will get them there uh, cognitivism is also the home of Bloom's taxonomy. If you're any kind of educator, you've probably heard of this. Uh, Bloom came up with this idea that learning is broken down into basically six uh, domains. The easiest and the lowest domain is remembering. The highest is creating. So remember I just talked about behaviorism where you might be using behaviorism to kind of recall basic facts and concepts to set a foundation for doing higher level learning. This is kind of where behaviorism kind of happens down here. Behaviorism isn't going to like result in people creating new things, right? But behaviorism might be a good strategy to use for these lower levels of um, Bloom's taxonomy. And then cognitivism and the next theory we'll talk about constructivism might apply better up here. So Bloom's taxonomy, if you want to write learning objectives, is also a great uh, source for getting uh, the behaviors that you want to see. A learning objective is all about writing out where you want, a, what do you want a learner to be able to do after a learning experience. If you want them to be able to define something, to classify something, to execute something, or to create something, Bloom's taxonomy is a great place to start uh, finding verbs to write out really effective learning objectives. All right. So that brings us to our third learning theory, constructivism. I love constructivism, but I think it's the hardest theory to really use. Constructivism goes a step farther than cognitivism. Each learner is really unique. They have a unique worldview. They have a unique philosophy. They have a unique experience. And learners in constructivism need to create their own meaning from experience. Now, this theory is... Um, 
maybe better understood if you're thinking like like doing an apprenticeship or if you're doing like Montessori style education or any sort of experiential learning. Constructivism states that learning needs to occur in context. So again, like an apprenticeship, uh, you're learning to do um, electrical work by maybe apprenticing as an electrician. So that learning is occurring in context and maybe by working with someone else that's an expert in the field. I really like this theory because it does say each mind constructs its own unique reality and learning is not objective. Like, how interesting is that, right? Everyone understands the world a little differently. I mean, who knows what goes on in other people mind, people's minds? In general, I think human brains are, are more alike than they are different. But think about how different personalities can be, how different people can be, how different people see the world. Sometimes I'm really struck by how someone else sees something that feels like it should be objective, but it's not. Anyhow, uh, here's the, the, the to the point philosophy of this theory. So learners are encouraged to construct their own understandings and then to validate through social negotiation these new perspectives. I really like that clause there, through social negotiation. This is all about treating people as people. Each human is unique, they are social, we're going to learn together, and they are going to construct their own meaning from experience. So again, apprenticeships, Montessori, experiential, that's where constructivism happens. I think this is kind of, kind of one of the harder ones to implement, especially in um, online teaching, because learning is not necessarily going to occur in context in online teaching, but this is a really great real-world uh, theory to put into practice in any sort of experiential learning. Okay. That's it for the big three learning theories. There's no one perfect theory. I mentioned earlier that when you're doing instructional design, there's not one perfect solution for any situation. There's lots of right ways to do things. There's lots of ways to get your work done, to get your learning experience completed. So selection, again, is gonna depend on your, what, on your learner and what your learner should be able to do, okay? It may also depend on how you're trying to fit something into like a larger learning experience. Um, again, depends on the learner, what they should be able to do. And you might use more than one in any given learning experience. As I mentioned, behaviorism can be a good foundation. Cognitivism can be a great way to think about scaffolding an experience on structuring things so that they are going to be processed really easily by your learner. And maybe constructivism is going to be like the capstone project where they're going to go out and apply something and have some experiential learning in the real world. So you might use more than one. Once you have a good understanding of how these three work, it helps to kind of figure out what strategies that you can use and what's going to work well for your target audience. So let's go ahead and do a knowledge check. So let's figure out your own understanding right now of these theories and how they work in the real world. So students are asked to write bios for historical figures. Then they're asked to analyze these figures impact. What is this an example of? I'll give you a moment. All right, so this one's an example of um, cognitivism because there's a structured experience here. They are doing some basic work where they're writing kind of summaries, brief bios of historical figures. And then they're having to do some analysis. Remember that Bloom's taxonomy at the very bottom was remembering. It moves up and up and up and one of those higher levels is analysis. So this is a good example of cognitivism. Next one. Students are given spelling tests and if they fail, their parents have to sign their tests. What is this an example of? This one is a good example of behaviorism. I mean, we don't really care if they have an understanding of what those words mean. We don't care if they have an understanding of why those words are spelled the way they are. We just care that they are spelling the words correctly. So the um, input here is, is uh, an example of external rewards and external punishments. Uh, if they don't get it right, then they know they're going to take it home to their parents. So we don't, we, we um, assume that they don't want that to happen. They don't want to, to take their failing scores home to be signed by their parents. So hopefully they're going to be externally motivated to figure out how to spell these words correctly. So that's some classic behaviorism right there. All right, last example here. Uh, sixth grade students are doing research and then they're going to create an original product project that illustrates the impact of pollution on marine life. What is this an example of? All 
All right, so this is kind of a light example of constructivism. You can see learning isn't necessarily occurring in context here, so work better as constructivism maybe if they were actually taking a field trip to a beach. They were examining uh, marine life in its, its, its habitat and maybe seeing pollution where it's happening on the beach. But this is a good example of um, constructing their own meaning from experience. So they are doing independent research. They're coming to their own conclusions here. This is a less structured experience where people are allowed to kind of explore their own interests to figure out the way they learn best and come to their own conclusions. So you can see this would take some really careful facilitation to make sure that they kind of end up where we want them to be and they don't come to any misunderstandings and that they do stay on track. So that's it for learning theories. Again, these big three learning theories uh, kind of form a good basis for branching out into hundreds of other learning theories. It's a really fascinating field in instructional design in which to study. This brings us to memory, motivation, and learning. So we gave you a definition of instructional design. We talked about two instructional design models. We went over the big three learning theories. So this is where we kind of are starting to kind of try to put these concepts together. So let's talk about how the brain actually works. This is my overly simplified model here of short-term and long-term memory. At its most simple, the way the mind works is that some piece of information goes into your short-term memory, and in order to be kept forever, to be able to recall this piece of information later, it needs to be transferred into your long-term memory. So this, in instructional design, is where the magic happens. We really want things to go from short-term into long-term memory. Think about, um, situations where you've been maybe in a lecture, even if it's a short lecture and you're passive, you're sitting back, you're listening and you're like, oh, that's like, they mentioned this book. I want to, I want to read this book, but you don't write the book down later on. You probably aren't going to remember what that book was, right? If you had actually maybe written it down, that would be an active act that would make it more likely to end up in your long-term memory besides having the note there. Um, besides, so this is where the magic happens. We want things to go into long-term memory in order for actual learning to be effective and to be long-term. We don't want thing, people to, to just remember stuff short-term. We want them to remember things long-term. So in order for that to happen, learners have to be paying attention. So if you're in a lecture, that same lecture, you're passive, you're sitting back, you're spacing out, you're thinking about what you want to make for dinner. All of a sudden, five minutes later, you realize you've been daydreaming and you missed five minutes of content in that lecture. You didn't learn anything because you were not paying attention. Learners have to be motivated to pay attention. Okay. So if at the moment where you start thinking about what you're going to make for dinner, the person up front in that lecture says, all right, listen up, the next five minutes are going to be on the test. You're probably going to be more motivated to pay attention in those five minutes, less likely to daydream. But again, what's really important is active learning. Passive learning experiences are never going to result in as much learning as active learning experiences, okay? So if you are get, able to get someone to be motivated, they're motivated, they're paying attention, and you're pairing that with some sort of active learning experience, learners are more likely to be able to transfer knowledge from short-term into long-term knowledge. That's really important. And as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier, adults are more likely to be self-motivated, but they have to see the value in whatever it is that they're learning. Children, on the other hand, are more likely to be motivated by external factors. So you kind of see, again, that behaviorism kind of coming into play here. Behaviorism might work better with children, where adults, they need to be treated like adults, and cognitivism or constructivism is going to be uh, more effective for those populations. So let's talk a little more about short-term memory. Short-term memory is anything you retain temporarily, usually no longer than one minute. It's whatever you're thinking about right now. So you're looking at the slide, if you're thinking about short-term memory right now, short-term memory is in your short-term memory. <laughs> it's whatever you're aware of at any given moment. It's also known as a few other things, short-term storage, temporary memory, primary memory, working memory. If you need an illustration of what short-term memory is, and you've seen Finding Nemo, you're familiar with Dory. Dory basically has lost the ability to transfer things into long-term knowledge. All she has is short-term memory. So the minute she stops thinking about something, it's gone and it's like it never existed. So it's used for, for humor, it's used for frustration, but imagine living like that. If you aren't able to transfer things to long-term memory, how awful would that be? In any case, 
Our goal, again, as instructional designers is to get our learners to transfer things from short-term into long-term memory. So what does short-term memory do? It actually serves two tasks for us. Um, of course, if we don't want to retain every single thing that we've ever thought about ever, right? There are people that have eidetic memories where they are able to remember just copious things. And it can be a frustrating experience to remember everything ever because everything you think about makes you think about other things. It can become very distracting. In any case, short-term memory is handy for helping us store new information briefly and to work on that information, okay? So we don't necessarily want to return, remember everything ever, but we want to have a healthy short-term memory. We're able to think about things, work on those things, and decide whether or not that's worth really moving into long-term memory. And that doesn't mean that learners have to be consciously moving things into long-term memory. It's just that the more they work with something, the more likely it is to end up in long-term memory. Now, there's this really interesting number called the magic number, seven plus or minus two. I cannot remember the researcher's name. I should have included that. But on average, the average person can only remember about seven things or keep seven things in their short-term memory at any given time, plus or minus two. So that means some people might only be able to keep five things in their short-term memory. Some people might be able to put nine things into their short-term memory. But on average, it's only about seven things the average person can really hold on to. And there's some newer research that actually shows that number is lower. Your short-term memory, your working memory, can't really hold that much information. So think about that as an instructional designer, when you're trying to throw a lot of new information at your learner, they're only gonna be able to hold on to a few small bits of information. They need time to process those and put those into long-term memory before moving on to something else. And it, they can get really overloaded very quickly. Again, information has to be transferred to long-term memory to stick around permanently. And the first step, in helping that process happen is to make new information sticky and easy to process. That means teaching people in a way that works for them. That means um, breaking down your content to work with that magic short-term memory number so you're never throwing too much at your learner at one time and really thinking about how you're not going to cognitively overload your learner. So. The takeaways here are you should always break up your teaching into chunks, okay? Uh, make it more active if you can. Um, keep the passive to, to more of a minimum. I really like this 10 and 2 rule for live instruction, even kind of like something recorded like I'm doing now. I'm trying to do no more than 10 minutes lecturing and then two minutes of active learning. I'm doing that pretty lightly in this presentation by offering those knowledge checks periodically, but it's important to have those breaks to do the active learning and to have a moment to um, process and reflect using breaks and learning activities. Again, there's only so much a human mind can take it in one given time. You need a moment to pause, work on this information, process it into long-term memory so that you can ready for something new. And I cannot say this enough, active learning helps transfer knowledge into long-term memory. It's really important. Again, we've talked about feedback briefly. If active learning is so critical to long-term memory, feedback is extremely important so that learners are remembering it correctly, okay? They're putting the right thing, the correct thing into the long-term memory, and they're not remembering something that's actually incorrect. Again, feedback is important because it also supports learner motivation and it does make the learner experience more meaningful. So it's really important to know that you're getting it right and you're making progress. That's a very human um, uh, characteristic is that we want to be competent. We want to get things right. We want to learn and grow. So feedback and the learning process helps us do that. If you're interested at all in memory and how it works, I highly recommend this book. This was the coolest book and it was like just really inspiring to me. It's called Moonwalking with Einstein. It's by this journalist who was actually sent to cover the World Memory Championships. The World Memory Championships are where people demonstrate astounding feats of memory by doing things like memorizing the exact order of a random deck of cards. And more than that, they can memorize the order of multiple decks of cards. So Joshua, the author here is so fascinated by how they do this, he actually learns these techniques himself and he returns the very next year to win the World Memory and Championships. So check out that book. It's fascinating. What the human brain can accomplish is truly incredible. All right, 
we are back to takeaways. We're pretty much all done. Again, I could only touch lightly on a lot of these concepts in this video. There's so much more out there to explore and I got a ton more content on my own YouTube channel and I'll be posting more videos regularly as well. But here's the big takeaways from this presentation. Instructional design is all about systematic planning and structuring, okay? Doing that systematic planning helps you ensure a lesson is focused, learner-centered, scaffolded, structured, uh, that you've really thought and incorporated all the things you know about how people learn and how the brain works so that you can create a really effective learning experience. So remember, use Addy, use Sam. Just be systematic in planning out your um, lesson so it is really focused. Nothing's in there that doesn't need to be in there, and your learners have the best chance of being successful. When it comes to memory motivation, remember, break up your teaching into chunks, break up your online content into chunks. If you're doing something live, use the 10 and two rule. It's really important to give your learners a chance to process. Um, whether you're online, whether you're, you're in person, you're doing something live, you're doing something recorded, chunk it, give your learners time to take breaks so they can process and include feedback wherever you can as well. Whenever the big three learning theories, they're called theories, they are science-based explanations for how people learn. They are a great place to get some ideas on how to teach your target audience. What theory you choose really depends on several factors. It depends on your learners, how they're learning, what you're learning. You might use several in a single learning experience. Again, there's no one right way to teach. There's no one right way to construct a learning experience. There's always tons of ways to get to where you want to go and where you want your learners to be. So there's a lot to consider here. Go out, explore, read some books. Highly encourage you to um, check out the Moonwalking with Einstein and that design for how people learn. They're both wonderful texts. And that's it from me. So if you would in the comments, write one thing from today's session that you can put into action today. Maybe write one more question that you are struggling to understand or a concept I know a little bit more about. And that's it. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this has been a helpful video and you're able to embark on your own instructional design journey.